Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody to our illustrious uh, forum of where we have uh, the college speaking. There are two rules at the College of Complexes. The first is uh, the first is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. I'd like to also uh, go over the briefly go over the format of the college. The first one is there's a uh, We'll have a brief announcements period. Second, then we'll have a, uh, a um, our presenter will then present up to about an hour. Then we'll have our question and answer period. And that's where we ask that you ask questions during that time and not make a statement or political statement because at the end of the program, after our question and answer period, I'll each, if anybody wants to do a rebuttal, a certain amount of time to uh, do so. All right, now at this point, I'm going to start the announcements and I'll stop the pause the recording while we do the announcements. All right, All right. tonight, our speaker, Jarrell, uh, is that? Yes, yes, that's correct, Jarrell, yes. Jarrell Corley, it is. Okay, all right, Jarrell, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Um, everybody else, please mute while we, Jarrell does his presentation. Jarrell, go ahead and share your screen and let's get started and uh, everybody go through this and I look forward to hearing it, Jarrell. All right, sounds good. Oh man. I'm sorry to bear with me. This is like my right, first time right. doing. That's all right, Jarrell. Um, is that, is that. Uh, okay. Are you using a Mac, I take it? I am. Okay, see, uh, do you know how to advance the slides? I know how to advance the slides, yes. Oh, wait, do I? Can everybody see that? All right. This is ridiculous. I now can we... see it. Okay, he's trying to right, get I'm gonna keep it. I'm just going to keep it like this. I don't know how to make the full screen go, but I'll figure it out later. But Okay, Jarrell. Here's me, guys. This is my first time doing a PowerPoint. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's go uh, to slides. But Let's so go basically slides. today's movement, is uh, today's presentation is going to be on the independent, otherwise I refer to it as the indie voters movement, how electoral reform can transform, transform American politics. Uh, my name is Jarrell Corley, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been an independent voting rights activist for over for the past 10 years. I got started uh, with this work with an organization called independentvoting.org out of New York City. And I've been working with them ever since as a hobby. Uh, while working with them, I was also introduced to another organization out of New York called Open Primaries. I now currently am the national sp spokesperson for Open Primaries. I published a few articles uh, recently in the Chicago Sun-Times, Blavity, and have also been featured on Yahoo News. <clears throat> I'm currently a commissioned officer in the United States military. Uh, I, I did. I did. A, I had two years of enlisted enlisted experience, and I commissioned last February. No, two Februarys ago in 2019. Which branch? And, I'm sorry. Which branch? Of uh, the army. Okay. And my, my participation here is uh, is not an endorsement of the, these activities by the United States government, the army, or any other uh, Department of Defense. I just want to let you guys know that it's completely okay. separate. Um, so what, what is the Indie Voters Movement? The Independent Voters Movement is a growing movement for American electoral reform. This movement consists of Americans from all creeds, colors, and political beliefs. Indie voters may believe in a different set of values, but they share one common belief. That belief is America's government is ineffective at addressing the problems of the day. Independents believe this ineffectiveness is a result of an unfair voting system that prioritizes the needs of the political parties over the American people. The independent voters movement aims to solve this issue with various types of electoral reforms. So our government reflects the notion that it, that it is for the people and by the people. Uh, a couple of quick, quick statistics. Uh, the independent, independents are the largest growing demographic of voters in this country today. However, that's not really talked about too much in the mainstream media, but according to the most recent Gallup poll, which I believe was conducted sometime last year, 
it was taken on uh, like party affiliation. 43% of Americans that qualify to vote in this country identify as independent. And that's one of the biggest uh, hitters of the independent voters movement is that if nearly half of the country identifies as independent, why is our voting system set up in such a way where you have to register to one of the two major parties to vote in one of the most important elections, which is actually the primary election. 90% uh, of American elections are determined in the primary election. Uh, uh, like, so when you first, I know you, most of you know this is basic politics, when uh, the first election is the primary and that's when all the candidates go and then they just sort of duke it out until the, uh, the, 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 the candidates from each party are going to represent the party. And so nine times out of 10, whoever wins the primary is more than likely going to win the general election. Uh, and that's because of gerrymandered districts for the most part in like our local elections. It's a little different for the presidential election, of course, because you have to get those last two uh, to, to fight to win the, the, the general. 60% of the American electorate votes in the presidential election. From some research that I've done, America has the lowest voter turnout amongst the developed democracies in the world. And we ask, why is that? You know, I thought we were the leader in democracy. Why is that? You know, I, I tend to believe that the reason we do that, the reason that we have such low turnout is because of the way our system is set up. And it's, it, we, we've reached a point where the situation is just bad. And there's no denying that, even though our politicians lie about everything, there's, the people cannot deny that the situation is bad and it's not getting any better. So I think that there's just an overall um, climate of apathy amongst the American electorate. And I think that's why voter turnout is so low because they don't believe the system is effective in addressing the problems of today. Furthermore, only 40% of the American electorate vote in the midterm elections, you know, and I don't think people realize that, hey, everyone thinks that the president is like a king, that he can just get things done. But what they don't realize is that we don't live in a monarchy, we live in a democracy, we live in a republic, and we refer to it as a democracy. And he needs, the president needs the assistance of Congress in order to get his agenda passed. But most people fail to realize this, and that's another reason probably why voter turnout is so low in the midterm election. And this also plays back into that earlier statistic, about 90% of elections are determined in the primary election. I think that statistic speaks primarily to state and local elections where oftentimes our elections are, the districts are drawn in such a manner where they're either heavily blue or heavy red. And that leads to a very uncompetitive election system where smaller candidates who don't necessarily have party endorsement or who are lesser known or third party candidates don't even stand a chance. So what incentive do the legislators who are running for office have to offer ideas rather than just talking points and sound bites that ultimately really are only just dividing people versus actually bringing them together to solve the issues. Uh, the problem, uh, we, I spoke on this earlier. The main problem right now is that we have uncompetitive primary elections. Currently right now, the majority of the elections in this country are closed primaries. So what are closed primaries? Closed primaries require you to register with one of the two major parties in order to vote in that primary election. So if you, so it, it, it basically can constricts you to who you can vote for. And these primary elections also attract the most ideological voters from both sides of the spectrum. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, like I said earlier from this earlier statistic, only 40% of American electorates vote, but that's the midterm, that's not only really the primary, so I won't get into that too much. But a lot of 
participate, a lot of voters don't vote in the primaries. And so oftentimes what you'll notice during the election cycle is that the language of the candidates is much more extreme during the primaries than it is once it moves closer and closer to the general. And that's because the reason why their language gets less and less extreme as the campaign cycle moves forward is because they're trying to uh, attract a larger net of voters. So if you know that a small percentage of the voters are gonna vote in the primary, you're gonna get, gear your message towards those voters to get their support so you can win the primary and almost be guaranteed a, a win in that general election. So that's why candidates have the most extreme uh, rhetoric. Third party or moderate candidates don't stand a chance. If, if many of you don't know this, you know, uh, independent and third party candidates have to collect a substantial amount more signatures to get on the ballot than the Democrats or Republicans. That's just another way that the system is set up to uh, give the parties an advantage. And in our current system that we vote in, people are voting for a party, not the candidate. You know, our current system does not really encourage ideas. It's more so the party's way or the highway. And I think a lot of people can connect with that because they know that there really are no more free thinkers in Congress. They're just saying the same old thing that the party bosses, you know, want them to say if they are to advance in their career versus trying to genuinely represent the people that elected them there in the first place. So when, when, when you have these closed primary systems and you make people choose a party to vote for, it limits who they can vote for. And then if the system is set up in such a way where candidates are encouraged to, to uh, base their message off who they think is going to vote for them, that's how they win. And then ultimately when the general election comes around, you don't really have a real choice. You're just voting for kind of who the party backed and things of that nature. Uh, it's an unrepresentative government. The way our system is set up, it does not incentivize politicians to be solutions oriented. You know, a lot of people are talking about special interest groups. We know about money and politics. You know, uh, a, pol a politician, that's their job. So people are naturally going to do what they have to do to keep their job. But unfortunately, the politicians are more aligned with the special interests who fund their campaigns and the party interests who basically control the course of their career because that's how they determine what committees they sit on and what type of power they yield and who in the party can get behind them to pass legislation. It's all determined on how well you can work with the Washington insiders versus how well you represent the voters. Uh, points of view are not represented. Oftentimes, I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, the world is very corruptible. Earlier, one woman made a statement about, you know, uh, having values and practicing abstinence. That's the way you can solve abortion. I mean, everyone can, you can agree or disagree with that statement, but the world, that's, I think that brings up a great point to the fact that the world is a very corruptible place. So we know that the world is very corruptible. And so these politicians, they don't, Free thinker, free thinking is not encouraged because the world is corrupted. So a lot of times you have, you may have these candidates that have these ideals that want to genuinely fix the issues in the world, but they find out that once they get to Washington, that that's not the case. You can't do that because they're corruptible. And you're not able to actually represent the views of people so much, like maybe the majority of people just, just what, is going to get traction and get immediate attention. And so I think that the, the views that are held by the views that are presented in the media probably are only the views of a small majority of people that are actually in the country. And that's because they're trying to rile up those extreme ends in order to just keep that separation going. Because how often are people from opposite ends of the spectrum having conversations about what they think and, may, and maybe learning from one another, changing their views. They're not because they think that the other side is all like what they see on the media, which is not true. Uh, it's very biased. 
uh, unresponsive government. You know, currently the American government is is bloated. It's it's just overly bureaucratic, and it's just lethargic, and it's unresponsive to the problems that we see in modern day society. And I think that this system just encourages that. You know, it's almost as if it's self defeating, as if there's more of an incentive to not get anything changed than there is to actually change it. And I just don't find that acceptable. You know, I think that America could do a lot better. And I think that these electoral reforms will incentivize our politicians to do a lot better. And there have been cases where this has been the case. I'm not gonna get into too many specifics about that, but there have been recent developments in this country where open primaries have been enacted to uh, different state legislators and even some of the federal elections, most recently with Maine. Uh, even in California, they've seen that some of the issues have been solved you know, because of open primaries, but they still have a lot of issues to move forward uh, that they need to fix as well, because as we all know, there's a lot of you know, messiness going on in California right now. Uh, gerrymandering, that's another process by which we disenfranchise voters. So the lines are drawn in party favors. A lot of the districts we live in are either heavily blue or heavily uh, red, and that limits competition. And if a district is drawn in such a way where the majority of voters are registered Republicans, there's no chance that a Democrat has an opportunity to win in that district. And the same thing goes for a mainly blue district as well. And even though you may have more candidates of the same party running, that candidate that has that familiar face, that has that popularity, he's going to win. And when he wins the primary election, he's going off to the general election unopposed and he's automatically won. So why are we stopping the process halfway through? You know, if there's two steps to the process, you should be fighting to the very end. Our current system doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work that way. And finally, you know, I already talked about, you know, the ineffective government, but lastly, you know, uh, our government is ineffective because it's always at a constant stalemate. And that's because uh, it's based on finger, po finger pointing and the blame game. And there is no incentive for the politicians to work together because it's more of an incentive for them to, to work against one another because that's just the way our, our, our political culture is, is set up right now. And electoral reform will hopefully make elections much more competitive therefore changing the behavior of the politicians to do the right thing because now they're more accountable to the people because there's more competition. The solution, uh, open primaries is the solution. Uh, 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 but I also think that it should be a combination of both open primaries and another mechanism known as ranked choice voting. So what are open primaries? Open primaries basically would open up the primaries and allow all voters to vote in an election, regardless of party affiliation or non-party affiliation. It would also allow for all the candidates to be on one ballot. So basically just a free for all. All the candidates are on one ballot, everyone votes for who they wanna vote for. And the uh, top two go to the next, uh, to the general, and they have a face off from there to win for the general election. Uh, this is good because it actually gives the people a choice and they don't have to choose which party they want to vote for. Furthermore, elections are taxpayer funded. So why is it that if you don't choose a party or if you belong to a third party, you can't participate in an election that you pay for? That's not right. That's almost like taxation without representation. And it's not, it's not very democratic if you ask me. Ranked choice voting is another concept which I think creates more choice for actual voters. And I think it also gives more power to third party candidates who voters often overlook because they believe they won't be able to win. So a combination of these two reforms I think is the best method to allow voters. So with ranked choice voting, let's just say you have you know, 10 different candidates that are running. 
on a ranked choice voting ballot, you would allow, you would be able to rank your top five candidates, one, two, three, four, five. So, and in this situation, if in the, in the primary, if one candidate did not receive 50% or more of the vote, there's going to be an instant runoff. And after that instant runoff, the candidate that receives the least amount of votes will be knocked off, knocked out of the race. And that instant runoff keeps occurring until one candidate receives 50% or more of the vote. And for each runoff, the candidate in each, in each level, in each next level, they would get knocked out of the race if they get the lowest amount of votes. And that process continues until one candidate receives 50% or more of the vote. I think this you know, opens up choice. It allows people to like uh, dive more into the issues on what the candidates believe in. It obviously creates much more competition. It's very, I think it makes candidates much more ideal uh, no, ideas uh, oriented versus problem oriented. And I think that it will cut back in the finger pointing and the blame game and the polarization that's called by the defamation of character and all of the personal attacks and just the, and the mudslinging, the nastiness that we all know politics uh, uh, creates. So I think that that's a, a great thing. I think it'll also allow voters to be more comfortable voting for that lesser known candidate that they actually believe in because there might be a chance for them to make it to the top because this sense, this system uh, um, and, like allows for that. Uh, district lines are also irrelevant because it's a proportional vote. If everyone in that area is allowed to vote despite their party differences and they rate their candidates, like district lines no, no longer remain relevant because it's all about the, the percentage of the votes that you get, not just the uh, small amount of the voters that voted in that majority red or blue uh, district. Uh, we're pretty much wrapping it up now. Um, this is just some things that I came up with personally. Uh, independent symbology. Uh, for me, the color purple basically represents a meshing of the Democrats and Republicans, red and blue. When you combine red and blue, that makes purple. So I think that me personally, I like the color purple for that reason to represent the independence, because I think that at least from my perspective, I share you know, some thoughts of both the parties. That's not to say that all independents are centrist. It's just to say that you know, I, I think that when you bring every, the, the, the entire political system together, red and blue, you get purple. The color yellow is basically just, uh, the, the symbol of change, you know, independence represent change. And we want to actually change the way we elect our government officials so we can hopefully change uh, some of the problems that are in uh, government. And, you know, the Republicans have the elephants and the Democrats have the donkey. So the independents just have the people, you know, the man is gray by default. I couldn't find a purple man. So that's just where, where that stands. But that I think that since the independents are really focused on the individual voters versus the party, our symbol should just be, be a person. And here's some other important websites. Like I said, I've been involved with this movement for the past 10 years. When I first got involved 10 years ago uh, in Florida, it was a very, I'll get to your question in one minute. It was a very lonely place. I, although we had the network out in New York, as a central hub, there I didn't I really was not familiar with a lot of other organizations and statewide movements that were occurring to change these types of reforms. And you look up, they're everywhere now. You have different reform initiatives in different states across the country. I feel like every six months or so, like every election season or so, a new ballot initiative is on the is on is on the is on the ballot. And in some instances they're losing and some they're winning. These are some of the other important websites, independentvoters.org. That was the first organization I was involved with. Uh, Open Primaries, that's another one that's based out of New York as well. Veterans for Political Innovation. They are working on electoral reform. However, their primary focus is uh, working with veterans and they're in Ohio. 
And one quick note, one more, a uh, few other notes about these first two organizations. Independent voters, they're more so of a network for people to come together and get training on how to be a spokesperson. And they have different guests to talk about different topics and things of that nature. They're not really involved in changing the process as much as they are involved in just connecting people and putting people together and just talking about the actual issue. Open primaries, they're working to uh, open the primaries and close primaries. That's their main philosophy. Veterans for Political Innovation, they are focused on open primaries with the additional ranked choice voting reform as well. The fair vote, they're also about ranked choice voting and some other type of reforms such as star voting, which I don't know too much about. The Institute for Political Innovation, uh, I gathered, I just recently met them about a month or so ago. I think their main focus is doing research and reconnaissance to determine which states they want to create new ballot initiatives in. I know that they were one of the uh, main forces behind Veterans for Political Innovation, if I'm correct. Uh, I spoke with their, I met with their founder a few months ago in Ohio, we had lunch. And that's what I gathered from him that he was able to get uh, some of his funding and his jump start from this organization right here. And finally, you have the Independent Voters Network. They are an advocate for ranked choice voting. You should check out their website. They have a lot of uh, good information out there on uh, these subjects. Uh, finally, uh, my social media, you can just look me up on Facebook, Jarrell Corley, LinkedIn, also my name, Instagram, also my name. And I also have a YouTube channel. I'm looking to, my YouTube channel basically has me in interviewing different people I find of interest. You know, I've interviewed people from the independent voters movement. Uh, I'm looking at like my, some of my upcoming interviews. I'm looking to interview um, a Republican candidate from Chicago, actually, who's running for the first Illinois congressional district. Uh, he is in Chicago. I'm looking to interview him in the upcoming weeks. I'm also trying to get a couple of the Democratic candidates on my channel as well. And from time to time, I may just share my personal views or just give people an update on what's going on on the ground uh, with the actual independent movement. And that pretty much wraps up my presentation for the day. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And now we will refer it to you with the questions. So I think Bob raised his hand first. Thanks for the spirit fingers. I see him. And then we'll get to Lewis after we answer Bob. So I think I just clicked this hand, right? Is that, if I click your hand, does that allow you to speak or how does that work? Uh, I just had to unmute myself and yeah, I'm ready. Um, okay. So my question is, uh, with this ranked choice voting, does that mean each party has their own uh, ranked choice uh, little, uh, you know, the candidates? So there'd be a- No, 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 there, no. There's just one ballot with all the candidates on the ballot. Then then there's, there's open, it's just open season. So then, then which ones would get picked then to run in the general election? The top right, two so you or would, the top three? Or? So basically you would rank you would rank your candidates. It's almost, do you watch basketball at all? No. Okay, I don't either. So I really can't use that analogy too. <laughs> I thought maybe if you did, you could, you could understand, you know, what is it called? March Madness, the top four, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Basically, I know. Oh, the brackets, yeah. Yeah, the brackets. That's basically what is is similar to that. So you go in there and you rank your top five candidates, right? And then after the first election, they tally up all the votes. If not one candidate gets 50% or more of the vote, they have an instant runoff. And in that instant runoff, still, if no candidate gets 50% or more of the vote, the candidate with the least amount of votes gets knocked off. Okay, so, so now that might have be five the, candidates, that you have four candidates, and that, that just be keeps the going. The green, the green basically, that keeps going until one candidate gets fifty percent or more of the vote. And then, if you, let's just say, like it got down to two well, candidates, who, who would you who would you who would you run against them in the general election? Because this is for a primary, right? Or is this the general? Right. It's for the well. So what I'm saying is that in the primary, if I get up until the general. 
if someone gets that 50%, I guess there will be no need to have a general. But let's just say before the general, two of those candidates got 49% of the vote. Okay, then the general will be between those two. But otherwise, if somebody gets 50%, then everybody else is not out. out. And that person just wins, basically. The majority has spoken. Because right now, oh. the way it's set up, at least with the like with the local, like with the state elections, you know, you have a very small percentage of people in the state actually voting to win to, to, to get that candidate in office. Because we all know most state government, it's very, it's very one way, red or, or red or blue. Like, I mean, every once in a while, like Illinois, for instance, okay, like my father, he tells me, you know, Illinois is Republican, you know, because like, because he works for the state, you know, he works the truck, you know, when, you, when you're out there in all those areas, like, you know, I just see Trump signs all day. I was like, that may be true. It might be more Republicans than, than Democrats in Illinois, but we all know that Illinois is run by the Democrats. <laughs> There's always a Democratic governor. Every once in a while, you might get a Republican governor. That, that's good. Eight. That's going to change in November, my friend. Oh, what, what do you mean? Oh, with the election? You think, do you think, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what's Derek his name? Bailey. They're going to kick him out, you think? Yeah, I think? yeah, I think he's gone. Who's the, uh, is, uh, I'm trying to think, who's the, uh, what is it, the whip, the majority? Who is that? I don't know. What is it, Michael know. Madigan? What, what, what position did I he I live hold? in Indiana, so I don't really know, but I, but I think that this guy, uh, I think his name is Bailey, Derek Bailey or something like that. Okay, I got he's you. From, uh, it's from somewhere in, in uh, I think, in the southern or mid central Illinois. But he's Aurora. Seems to have is that it? No, I'm not sure. No, no, that's different, guys. No, that's Irwin. Gotcha, yeah, he's, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, he's All right. Okay, we're okay. gonna we're, we're, we're gonna take it on to the next question. We have Lewis here. Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jarrell. Thank you. Am I saying your name right, Jarrell? Yes, Jarrell. Jarrell. Yes. Jarrell. Yeah. Thank you very much for that very. Oh, he's happy. That very, Look how that tail goes. That very thorough uh, presentation. Uh, could other people? I'm, I'm going to ask. Uh, can someone? Can you guys mute your your mics if you're not speaking, please? Um. I just wanted. Uh, I thought it was a very thorough presentation. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple of things. I think like that, you know, on the question of apathy, uh, somebody wrote a book uh, years ago, which I didn't read called uh, Manufacturing Consent. I, I think it's important to understand that voter apathy is something that has been manufactured by our, mm -hmm. existing, by our existing political system. It has actually been engineered to produce apathy in the electorate and to reduce the number of people who, who feel like going to the polls. Can we have a question period here instead of a statement period, please? I, I, that's what we're trying to work through. Lewis is next. Lewis, you got a question? Do I All have right. a question? I guess we'll. Okay, okay Lewis, we'll back to Lewis the statement at the end. end. Well, well, we wait, have, uh, wait a minute. I thought we were having a dialogue. It's a I, I think you're saving that for the end. Okay. All right. Lewis, no, no, it's, it's no problem, Lewis, because at the after the questions and answers, we're each going to get maybe three to five minutes to uh, make a mini presentation of what we think. And then at the end, uh, Jarrell will be more than happy to get the last word. So um, very well. Uh, we appreciate your, your coming, Lois. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of confusing for some of the newer newcomers, but okay. if we All appreciate right. everything else. Okay, All right. Ernie, Ernie, I have uh, Ernie Norman, Karina, John Eldon, and Jake. Uh, and I'm then Jan. Okay, Ernie, go ahead. And, and and I thank you very much, Jarrell, for helping me moderate tonight. So Ernie no, Norman, no you're next. Yeah, uh, I think, hold on. Yeah, I'm I'm unmuted. Yeah, uh, Jarrell, I appreciate what you're doing here. I think that we, uh, we seriously need. Uh, Tim, can you figure out who it is that's in the background there? And Leave you... us the lady in the upper hand corner, I think, possibly. I yeah, don't it's know. Karina. Uh, that's okay, Karina. We'll, we'll mute you until you're ready to go, okay? All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, I appreciate what you're doing. I think that uh, I agree with you. We have serious problems in this country. Uh, I'll speak on this in a rebuttal, but I just wanted to say I enjoyed it. My question is, 
you gave some statistics on the percentage of people who vote. I think you said 60% for president, 40% in midterms and some other numbers. Now, are those eligible voters or registered voters? And, and how do you get your numbers on that? Well, I, well, I feel like, I mean, if, I feel like if you're, if you're registered, then you have to be eligible. So I think, oh, you know what, that, that makes a great point. I see what you're saying now, because you really, so I, so I, I got my statistics from different organizations that are yeah. either in the fight or that I work with. Okay. And that is a great question. So I will pass that on and ask how they collected their numbers, whether or not those were registered or eligible. eligible. Because if they were registered voters, I take it you could just look at the polls yeah. and see who voted and who didn't. Right. And if they're eligible, I guess you could just see like, I don't know if there's a database that like tells you like, I guess you can go to the census and see like, all right, well, how many people are between the ages of 18 and whatever age and yeah. how many of those people are registered and you can like get the numbers that way too. Yeah. That well, it's, it's either, obviously there are more uh, eligible voters than registered voters. True. But I'm just, but the problem, the problem we have is, is uh, a lot of people who are eligible just don't even bother to register. And I'm just wondering. This is true. And a lot. This, this is true. And I, and I think I think a lot of that goes back to uh, Lewis's point earlier about you know this apathy. Like I know a lot of people yes. who don't even bother registering; they don't even care. Like That's it doesn't right. matter. Not you know, involved so. at all. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question, uh, Karina. Karina Gaster. Yes. Here I am. And what I want to ask is, you know, you've been talking about Republicans and Democrats, and I was thinking, would people be more interested in voting, or do you see a future for breaking out of just Republican and Democrats, but having third parties like they have in Italy, and that, and in my opinion, this will break up a lot of the kind of the political bargain, bargaining and uh, the parties holding each other over the barrel, like when we had with the government shutdown and extracting um, compromises from each other, that if there would be more balance in the system, if we had multi-party system like they have in Italy, and you would have different causes uh, uh, that uh, you know, one party would not hold something pro and con, but you would have different issues, like one party uh, advocating an environmental protection. Uh, that makes sense. Of, I I I got you. I got you. Um, I do think that that's a possibility. I'm not sure if any of you uh, are familiar with Andrew Yang or not. He uh, as an Asian American businessman. He ran for president in 2020. He he lost. He also ran for mayor in New York City, and he lost again. And he's actually started a super PAC last October, I believe it was, and it's called the Forward Party. So you can go to, and one of his main platforms is electoral reform. And I believe they've started their first party chapter in Minnesota. So I do think that there is a movement for that. Me personally, I've always wished for that kind of. I don't really know how the dynamics work. I think it might make things more hectic. I'm not entirely sure. So I don't want to um, affirmatively state whether I think that'll solve the issues. But as far as me personally, I don't want more parties. I want no parties, honestly. I just want to get rid of them all together. You know, I think that you know, our founding fathers nearly 400 years ago, if my math is correct, they warned us about this situation. This is the very situation they ran from in England. You know, there was a civil war going on between the two major political factions. They came over here to America to establish a true democracy. Now, obviously they fell short, but you know, you know those founding documents are, 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 are a moral compass to get us in the right direction. Um, so I think they said, you know, that the parties will usurp the power of the people. That was, that was said 400 years ago. And here we are today in that very situation 
that they warned us about. And ultimately, it's the fault of the people. You know, we deserve the government we have because we have been less involved. You know, I, I'm a big, I'm big on history. And I used to read that people used to go to bars and talk politics. That's like one of the taboos nowadays. You'll never hear anyone talking politics in a bar. <laughs> so I think that, you know, we need to bring that culture back where, you know, people are discussing politics in a civil manner and just saying that, hey, look, just because you don't, just because you disagree with me, doesn't mean I have to hate you. Just because you disagree with me, doesn't, maybe I disagree with you because I don't fully understand. Maybe I disagree with you because I disagree with you, but that's okay. You know, and I think that we have to open that up, that dialogue up so people can find uh, a, a solution versus just finger pointing and blaming. But that's, but I, I want to get rid of all parties. I, death to the parties is what I said. So, uh, John. Okay, great. Well, obviously, I, I'm, I'm one of your, you know, I'm on your side. But a couple of quick uh, corrections. It's independentvoting.org. Uh, the website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, that. And ranked choice can be used either as a single ballot, so no need for a primary. That's what they do in Australia and Ireland. It's ranked choice. Whoever comes out on top, that's it. Or you can use it as a feeder, as you described, into a runoff of two, three, or four people uh, at the end. So a couple of different ways of playing that. Uh, so those were just two quick uh, points I wanted to make on that. Okay, thank you, thank you. Was that is that all you had? You didn't have a question? Okay. Oh, and I also put in John Adams' uh, quote about um, political parties. It's in the chat. All right, thank you. Great, great. Okay, uh, Jake, I think I, I know you're calling next. Yeah, I muted you, so unmute real quick, um, mm -hmm. and we'll be ready to hear hear your question. Jake, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, Jake. I'm muted. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, what was my question? Um, so you're proposing a uh, 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 nonpartisan primary, and I know that's happened in, in, in a number of states. Um, if you have a nonpartisan primary, how do you deal with partisan positions like Democratic committeemen or Republican committeemen or chair of the Demo or the, of the Cook County Democratic or Republican Party, that kind of thing. Well, I think that's something that is resolved internally with the party. I don't think voters really have a say in who gets elected to those positions within the party. No, that isn't that isn't so. The the, the chairman of chairman of the parties, I think, are. Are, are are elected internally, but the committee men are voted by voted on on uh, by the voters during the primaries. It's one of the reasons why you why you uh, it's one of the reasons why you declare a party during the primary. So I wonder how in states like California, which has a strong Democratic Party, still deal is a not if you have a nonpartisan primary, but you still deal with the issue of committee men and, and other party positions. Now these committee men are these like like what positions do they hold do they hold? Okay. Committee men is a non is a non paid position within the party. And the main purpose the main function of the committee men as far as uh, is according to my understanding is just to help get out the vote is 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 to help slate the candidates that come up on the ballot, number one, and number two, okay. help to get out the vote on election day. All right, so basically the, the people actually elect these committee men? Right. Yeah, that's how it works in California. It's an open primary okay. for everything else, all the candidates. But if you're registered Republican, you have a ballot that includes the committee members for the Republican Party. If you're registered Democrat, you have them. I'm registered no party preference, so I don't get to vote on either of those. But I do get to vote on all okay. the candidates. Oh, okay, 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 that makes sense. Okay, the other the other question I had is if um that makes sense. Okay, if you're if, if you're talking about things like rank rank choice voting and nonpartisan primaries, and what was the other thing that you were proposing? Those are pretty much the main two that I, that I'm on board okay. with. As of okay. Now. I, well, I briefly both mentioned. Both of them. Okay. Both of them. Both of those. Both of those concepts would require 
a, a constitutional amendment? How do you go about doing that? Are you saying uh, in general or specifically in Illinois? Well, in general, either, either way. Well, there's a number of ways you can do that. So one of the ways is you can like, you know, do a, what's called a ballot initiative. You right. have some lawyers draw up the language and then you, right. you get the signatures to get right. it on the ballot, you get it on the ballot, right. and then you get it passed by a majority. Uh, in Illinois, right. I believe it's a little bit more difficult to do that. I believe you have to do like a uh, actual piece of legislation. So uh, it's going to be tricky uh, here in Illinois. Mm -hmm. but... You can do it either way. You can do it either way. You can either circulate position. If it's a okay. statewide thing, you circulate petitions statewide, and you have to get enough signatures. Well, it's not or that. I think it's more so the type, the type of initiative that you want to get. And I'm not. The last time I checked with okay. some people over over at um, I forget the name of the organization. I think it was the second to last organization I mentioned in my PowerPoint. They were just saying that this particular ballot initiative regarding voting is much harder to get than other types of ballot initiatives. They really well, made it it's, difficult. It's, it's, I'm sorry. it's a misunder misunderstanding. And by the Illinois Constitution, if you put a if you put a, a referendum on the ballot concerning form of government, which was, this would be, if it passes, it's legally binding. Any other kind of referendum question is, 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 um, is uh, advisory only. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, that's fair enough. I, I need to look more into that myself, but, uh, but thank you for, uh, for that clarification. Yeah. All right. So next we have uh, Nancy. Hi. I, we can't hear you. I think I think you're muted again. Hello. Okay. Now, can you hear me now? All right. We got you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm also a, a longtime activist for political process reform, like open primaries. So I appreciate your, you know, the efforts that you've put in, uh, Jarrell and. I was wondering what, you know, what your personal, what brought you personally to th this activism in the, you know, 10 years ago? And well, I, I, I come from a, um, a very politically involved family. My grandfather was sort of, he was very much so involved in uh, city politics back in his age. Uh, he passed away about five years ago, bless his heart. He was a great, he was, he was my biggest role model. And so I've always sort of been involved, you know, whether it was like collecting signatures, you know, with my mom when I was younger or, you know, just out there with like a picket sign, you know, fighting for what I thought I believed in, you know. Uh, and so I, I, I mainly worked for like a lot of democratic uh, organizations, but since I was a kid, I just always knew it was a bunch of BS. I don't know why I knew that. I just knew. I was like, this doesn't make, I was like, this, this shit, excuse my language, I was like, this shit don't make no sense to me. Right. You know, I remember being like seven years old in history class saying that to myself in the head. And so, um, you know, I, I was just very discontent with working with Democrats. And I think at that time I was uh, working with the Obama campaign down in Florida for his reelection campaign. And then after that, I was just like, you know what, I'm just doing all this. I don't see anything coming out of it. I was like, well, if I'm going to, you know, volunteer my time for something, I'm going to volunteer for something that, like, is actually worth a damn, that, like, actually has a meaning. And so that's when I just started looking up um, independent voters. And that's how I stumbled across independentvoting.org. And, like, I don't know what it was, but, like, I just... I participated in a couple of online events they had. They liked what I had to say, and they just, they, they just, they uh, gave me resources to empower me, you know, to just amplify my voice. And they have those sorts of resources for anyone who wants to get more involved. And there was no, there was never really a push, you know, for that sort of personal or professional development from you know, any of the party campaigns that I worked for. I can't speak on behalf of a Republican campaign. I never worked for a Republican campaign, but I'm pretty sure it's the same thing over there. It's just, hey, look, 
we need you here to work on this and that's why you're here and mm -hmm. if you get in or you know someone there you can get a paid position later on or do something we got you if not you're just here to volunteer when the election's over go kick rocks you know so mm -hmm. so right. yeah all right good job thank you uh, uh, uh jan Thank you very much for the presentation, Daryl. And uh, I think it was very interesting. Um, I just wanted to make two clarification points. When Mike Madigan uh, was kicked out as Speaker of the House, a That's person, not pardon me, yeah, Chris, yeah. Uh, Chris Welch is the person who is now Speaker of the House. Okay. And uh, you, can, you can look him up. Um, so I wanted to clarify that. I don't Is he Republican or Democrat? Well, he's a Democrat because the um, because the House is dem is primarily Democratic. Oh right, of course, of course. So, of course. so the Speaker is going to be a Democrat, and okay. the, uh, and uh, I think that they call the uh, Republican uh, the ranking member. Okay, so, sounds good. So the Republican who's been in the House the longest is called the ranking member. And um, then the Democrat is called the speaker because there's more okay. Democrats than Republicans. And then the, and the only other thing I wanted to say is that manufacturing consent is like an ancient book. And um, it, it's called Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of the Mass Media. And it's by Edward S. Herman and Noam Chomsky. And there's- okay. There's been a movie made of it, um, which right. was, which was, I mean, I slept through that movie. It was really boring. I thought, but whatever. Anyway. Fair enough. Okay. So did, did you have a question, Jan? Uh, yeah, I didn't have a question. I, I apologize. I didn't have a question. Thank okay. You. No worries. Th thanks for your input. Thank you. All right. So Charles, you're next. Yes, sir. Uh, I serve on. Uh, several uh, candidate selection committees. You may uh, consider me uh, this, uh, you had a derogatory term for uh, a regular uh, party uh, people. Uh, but I, I am amazed the number of people I've sat through who appear before selection committees are totally and absolutely unqualified to run for office. Oh, hands down. Yeah. I mean, they are absolute <laughs> nincompoops. Yeah. Uh, look at this. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't I, know. Trust I mean, me, I'm, I'm shaking some honest. people's hands. You're, and I'm like, oh, aim, know where you, where you are. <laughs> your aim is to achieve good government. And I don't know how that's achieved by putting these people on the ballot. I told you earlier, today, or I just got called by two candidates to be their campaign manager. I declined both of them very delicately without telling them that I don't think they're qualified to, to do anything. Oh, <laughs> let alone run the government of this country and at any level. Now, you want to open it up? For what? For, for these people to be in an elective office and that's going to make good government? Oh, so you think opening up would make it a, a shoe in for worse candidates? What what guarantee <laughs> you have that these unqualified people would not run and get elected? Do you have any any means in your proposal to preclude that from happening? Is there any? <laughs> well, I think it's happening now. I mean, in the closed primary system, you have unqualified people that, that are running. The, the people that are in government now. I don't think they're necessarily qualified to, you know, handle the issue of, of running in a government. I mean, it's, it's a quite large task. I think ultimately what we're trying to do it, I, what we think opening, we think these reforms will basically give elected officials an incentive for good behavior. Like right now, there's no incentive to, for good behavior. There are a lot of policy ideas out there that are great, but they won't see the light of day because as our system stands now, it's not very solutions oriented. It's just take care of the special interest, 
take care of the interests of the party and get and do what has to be done so I can keep my seat for the next election. There's no incentive for good behavior. What and, are you talking about? There's a there's a ethics committees on all levels of government. But I mean, okay, that's fair to say, but would you honestly, can you sit here and say that our country's in good shape right now? I mean, you got your Bernie Sanders poster back there. You would have preferred Bernie, Bernie, Bernie Sanders to have won. If we had open primaries or if the system of elections was fair, Bernie Sanders probably would have won instead of Trump in 2020. A lot of Bernie supporters actually went over to Trump. From what, from my understanding, if I heard that correct, the Democratic Party blocked Bernie Sanders because they wanted Hillary Clinton to win. That I entire fiasco with the convention back in 2020. This nation is very well run. I'm sorry, sir. We're the best run nation on earth. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that there's still a lot of problems that we need to get solved. We need to get fixed. And they and I think that our, our government is ineffective in, in doing that. And ultimately, I'm not really here to talk about, you know, whether it's run well or why it's not run well. You know, uh, I, I'm just more so trying to make it more representative for the voters. Right now, I don't think that our current system is very reflective of the views of the voters. It's very party uh, centered. It's not voter centered. And a lot of people are not what satisfied that mean? with the situation. What does that mean? What with what? What does what mean? It's it's not voter centered. Of course, it's voter centered. Okay, let's move on. What is your question exactly? Okay. What is your question? What is your question exactly? Well, you you said it's party centered, not voter centered. I have no idea what you're talking about. And so there's some issues out there standing, a few hot button issues. And you, you're saying the sky is falling like chicken little. No, no, Can I, we I'm move not, on not, now? I think, Charlie, falling, what I'm saying is that I Charlie think you've been going better. on and on. I mean, follow the rules, OK? Uh, next question. You're going to tell me I, about I, I the come rules. back to that. <laughs> Make you I appreciate the, the challenge. Man. I appreciate the whole the challenge. Damn I appreciate the challenge. <laughs> All right, uh, Raj. Raj, you're next. Unmute, Raj. Thanks, Gerald. Hi, I hello. Okay, Roger. Yes. Okay, I have a have you, have you do you know anything anywhere the system you are trying to implement has been done, and if it is done, use an election, and the candidates select they selected. Were they good candidates? Were they better candidates than we have normally? They represented the people better than. Okay. Than okay. So I believe Nebraska has had open primaries since like 1904. And okay. they have, you know, I don't know all this at the top of my head, but I know they have one of the most like well working legislatures in the country, Nebraska. They have nonpartisan open primaries and they have one of the most well working. Uh, legislators in the country. I do know that there have been, from the, the last organization I spoke about, I believe it was the Institute for Political Innovation, they have seen where there was a state on the East Coast. I want to say it's um, Pennsylvania, but I'm not entirely sure. It's somewhere on the East Coast. I'm, and they I'm, said- I'm, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt you, but- uh... I mean, you you are speaking on issue, so you should have some knowledge before you speak that uh, your system, what you are asking us to accept, has been implemented somewhere, and they got to have a knowledge that is going to is delivering what you are saying that your system will deliver. This, this, okay, this, this so is absolutely true. This is absolutely true. So, so I'm I'm going to stop you right there. You know, I do this on the side. This is a hobby. So I can't possibly know everything. And I'm not gonna sit here and it's not, it's, present. So no, let, let me finish. Okay. I'm trying to, t you, 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 you asked a question. I gave you over a 30 minute presentation. If I can't answer your question, I presented you with resources that you can go do some research 
and ask it and answer your own questions. There's no, no way in no. the world that I can possibly know everything around these issues. I'm but not asking, I, I'm not asking what I'm trying to tell you is that I can put you in touch. I can get some, I can get back to you on that information if you like. And I can get more specifics, but I don't have specifics on that. But from what I've been told that there has been, this has been in a situation. So I'm not here to sell anyone or anything. I, this is what I believe in. And yes, I do need to get better at my presentation skills, but if you don't, if you don't, if you don't want to, if you ain't, if, if, listen, if you don't want to buy it, I'm, I'm going to stop selling it. It's not, I mean, if, if I'm selling something, then I got to know what the heck I'm selling and how it had worked and where customers are satisfied or not. Okay, I cannot sell something to you if I do not know how my product is working in a market, how, how the customer who bought that thing are satisfied. It is not enough for me that the customer bought it. That's not enough. I got to that's know. Fair. That's, that that's, fair. that's fair, that's well, fair. Okay, well, here's what I'll say, here's what I'll say. I cannot affirmatively answer that question. If you like, okay. I will get back to you. Put your email in the okay, group chat. You. I'll do some research and I will get back to you if you like. Okay. How does that okay. sound? Okay, I have a second question in, in quickly. And and that is that, that uh, I have noticed that uh, when our, uh, our smoke filled room disappeared, we have uh, our, our elected representatives have uh, less communications with the voters and the uh, and general public at large that they represented. How your system will represent better? We'll make the president better? You know, that represent their, their constituency better. So ultimately, I think it'll make the president better because one, it'll make elections much more competitive. So it will require the president to run off of actual ideas and have knowledge of the ideas that he's going to implement. Furthermore, it will also incentivize Congress to work together to implement those best ideas. Because as it stands now, in Illinois, for instance, you have, this is probably indicative over the entire country, you have career politicians that have not really improved the, the, the living standards or the conditions of the people that they represent in some, maybe more, most instances, or the overall situation has gotten worse as, as the years go on but somehow they still get elected to office. So if we, have, if we put this mechanism in place where you incentivize the politicians to work together to actually create solutions and have a track record, you, 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 make, you make politicians accountable because you, I'm lost for words now, you, um, they can run off of a track record, off of their merit versus their popularity or their endorsement by the party or other po corporate pulpits or other like, you know, um, so-called experts in the media, basically. Does that make sense? No, I mean, I mean uh, you are trying to tell me that a system, in a system in a way people get elected, that makes them better or worse. And I, I haven't seen may, my, my, Michael Maddy, Michael Maddy done whatever he saw coming, whatever his corruption, but he ran the, the Senate pretty well and passed the bills. And we have, we have done pretty well in Illinois. Okay, sure, sure, we have gone through a long process where there were discrimination, there were corruption, everything was there. But Illinois was run well. Michael Maddy I, he was bad in a corruption, but corrupt person, but uh, process work, and we did a good job. But anyway, I'll stop there, and I will the rest of the thing I'll take up with my my rebuttal. Thank you. Okay, okay, I, I appreciate your comments. Thank you. All right. Uh, All right. Is it, uh, wait, I think Jake is next. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. What was my question? Um, yeah. Uh, first, first of all, sorry, I missed the beginning. Could you state your name and affiliation again? Oh, my name is Jarrell Corley, and I'm speaking on behalf of. 
I guess, independent voters, but I, I'm, I'm a national spokesperson for an organization out of New York City called Open Primaries. And I'm just oh, really okay. doing this. Okay. I'm really doing this okay. on my own behalf, but I'm not doing this on behalf of any organization. I am a national right. spokesperson for Open Primaries, but okay. this is okay. my, this is my, I put this presentation together. Okay, so you're 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 adv you're advocating eliminating all political parties. If that's the case, no, no, um, I'm not. I'm not advocating you... for that. I'm sorry. I oh, let you finish. Okay. I apologize. I apologize. Okay, but you said you like to you like to see uh, political parties uh, eliminated or what? I'm not advocating for that. But someone okay. asked whether I was for a third party. I'm not for a third party. If I'd have it my way, I'd get rid of all the parties. Yeah, well, but that's I, what I'm saying. If you, if you if you if you if you got if you got rid of all the parties, how would you screen candidates? How would you facilitate the whole process? Well, we're not here to really yeah. talk about that. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about open primaries. Okay. About all right, right. Tools. So you still, I'm not, I'm not so advocating. Still, okay, so you'd still have the two parties, but you'd have have open primaries. Okay. Right. right. Like, right. Yeah. So basically, our reforms are not getting rid of the parties. You'll still have the parties. We just want to make it so everyone can vote for everyone in the primary. Okay. Like you right. shouldn't. We, we we believe that you should not be forced to choose a party to choose from candidates. Like right now, the parties they're playing a game where they're limiting your choices. And they're restricting voters from voting. I guess people would argue, well, go join a party. But why should I have to join a party? Yeah, no, like, I can instance, understand I think, that. Tag, but how, no, Tim, okay. Tim, I'm sorry, Tim. I don't mean yes. to put, put you on a I don't mean to put you on a spot, Tim, but Tim's a Republican, okay? And I'm not here to talk about whether you know Trump or Biden or Obama was yes. good or bad. I'm not here to talk about all that. The point that I'm making is that Tim's a Republican. He chose not to vote for Trump because he didn't want to vote for Trump. Right. So he voted for Biden. So what I'm saying is that okay. he was forced to go choose a Democratic ballot mm -hmm. to go vote for Biden because he didn't want to vote for Trump. Why should you have to do that? Every, all candidates should be on the same ballot and everybody should be able to vote for whoever they want to vote for. Okay. Yeah. No, I can see. I can see that the tend, the tends to the tends to 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 bring people more towards the center as opposed to the extremes. But uh, um, how if you have if you have a nonpartisan primary, then how do you screen out bogus candidates? For example, uh, do you remember in the uh, was it 1990? No. 1986 election. There were two Larusha candidates on the Democratic Party ballot that, that took people it took everybody by surprise if you have an op open primary process how do you how do you how do you screen out bogus candidates oh, okay so that's that, that's that's this is, i was born in 86 so i don't even know what you're talking about <laughs> but, oh, but that is okay, definitely no, a there's, there, there's two what happened what happened was no, I, 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 in had, theory i understand what you're talking about but that specific right, right, example right. you gave okay. yeah i don't know about right. that but 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 think but think about this so I've asked that question to my superiors because that is definitely often an issue that is raised with people when I'm talking to them in the public. Okay, that rarely happens. The last example of that that happened was back in 1986 for one. And then two, I just feel like there would have to be some sort of conspiracy going on. Like the amount of, the amount of organization that you would have to get involved in order to make that successful to like basically have two bogus Democratic candidates fighting against one another so a Republican can get, can get, can get in like a majority Democratic area. I just don't like, that That would take a lot of organizing and probably illegal activity to even make that possible to happen. Well, it wasn't even, I just think it it's like- It wasn't illegal. It wasn't illegal. What happened, happened was, it's far from being- It wasn't able. illegal. What, what happened was it was a non-contested primary and so the Democrats fell asleep and they woke okay. up the day after the election. To, to to and they realized that these these two the two candidates who they didn't even know who they were, uh, 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 Mark Fairchild and I can't remember the other woman's name, uh, mm. 
They were their followers of Lyndon LaRouche. They went to court to try to throw them off the ballot, and the court ruled that they couldn't because they already won the, the primary. So it, it, it screwed up the election for Adlai Stevens, and there are other reasons why he lost, but it screwed it up for him. For the, the, the two years, two years later, uh, there were Sheila Jones, what's her name? There, there were two, there were two more, uh, two more uh, Larouche candidates who tried to infiltrate the ballot, and this time we knew who we were, so we alerted to people to it, and they got very few votes. Okay, okay. Uh, there's a theory uh, that's behind that, and I'll have to, uh, you know. Th- uh, figure that one out to get better to, to come up with a rebuttal for, for that statement. But that's why we want to have a, that's why I believe personally, I'm going to stop saying we, that's why I believe personally a combination of open primaries and ranked choice voting would prevent that sort of thing from happening. Okay. Um, I guess we're more, okay. Jarrell, are you done with your point at this point? I, I am. Yes. Tim, All I'm right, ready. Jan, you're next. I would say that of all the people here who disagree with each other the most, it would be me and, me and Bob Matter. Uh, but, Bob <laughs> brought, but Bob brought up a very important question, I think. And that is, um, but with the idea of having nonpartisan voting and strict majority voting, um, I believe what would happen is the candidates would flock to um, Los Angeles and New York and maybe Chicago and other uh, big cities that mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. that are highly democratic. Okay. And um, then the, the people in in the outback, if you'll pardon that expression, it doesn't belong in the United States, but the people who live uh, in Places like rural areas. That's the rural. rural. Areas, right. The people mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. are rural, rural would uh, would never see a candidate. In their You're office. speaking for uh, for president, correct? Not just president. I mean, what about Illinois? If um, uh, but wait a minute. But if, but if every but if everyone's voting in the state. I don't see how that could happen because they still you'd have to win the majority of the votes. So all what you're saying is that there's more people in the city, in the in the in the in the urban areas than in the rural areas. And that and that's going to attract the candidates during the okay. during, during that the makes election, sense. during during that the election sense. time. And um of course we've been shocked in Illinois when downstate voters that, that makes sense. Well, uh, it's interesting you bring that point up. Open primaries, they recently, I, I, I highly suggest you guys check out some of the organizations that I've mentioned in the, uh, in, in the presentation. Uh, open primaries recently had a discussion with an author. Uh, he wrote a book. I forgot exactly the name of the book it's called, but it was on that issue of rural areas. And they were, the discussion was based around how open primaries can positively affect or make democracy or make government work again for the rural areas. I think that what you're stating is definitely a, a great point uh, to, to bring up. But I feel like from the representative point of view, those state government, like so those state elected officials that are in those rural areas, I believe that's how you would get your representation. And ultimately, I think that it would make those, because I'm not from a rural area, so mm-hmm. I don't know whether everyone is satisfied with their, with, with their current officials. Maybe they are. But what I'm saying is that if you are unsatisfied with your elected officials, this format of doing elections will make elections more competitive. Okay. Well, give uh, your elected officials an incentive to do what you need or want them to do to make your area better. And if they don't, then you can vote somebody else in there who will. Because as it stands now, the way the system is set up, the way those uh, districts are gerrymandered, the same person has been running your district for Lord knows how long. Yeah. And things have probably remained the same. And that's because of the way the system is set up. 
Um, John Eldon put in the chat that open primaries would help solve this particular problem. I think he's talking about the problem that I brought up and that oh, Bob yeah. Matter brought up. So right. I, I, I think extreme, yeah. I think perhaps also I, I think uh, uh, I think perhaps um, I don't understand it well enough to have even posted. That's fine. That, that that's fair. What I'll do is uh, with with Charles and Tim's permission. Yeah. I'll reach back out to open primaries. I'll get the link. I believe they have a recording of that discussion and I'll send that link out to you where you can watch the discussion where they're talking about that very issue. Because I, I do think that is a great issue right now. I feel like a lot of rural areas feel like they're being left out, you know, of the conversation or out of the, uh, or just being left out the loop, you know, and a lot of stuff is being uh, focused more so on urban. And that's a very legitimate and valid point, concern. Okay. Uh, but but I, me I me I personally personally think that this will make the situation better for everyone. You know I, I could be wrong, but I believe in this. Like I'm not here trying to, you know, sell you on something because in my opinion, if you have to sell someone on something, then they're not interested in it. You're like trying to finesse or like um, convince them. If, if that, does that I don't know if that makes sense. Like, you know how like those pushy salesmen are you know what I mean like that that's not who I am so if I don't know something I'll let you know and I'll, I'll try to get back to you with an answer okay uh Charlie I know you're up for another uh question so uh go ahead and uh, round two you ready, you ready? <laughs> well ready to duke it out? I think we're going to go ahead and intimidate Charlie all right Gerald uh, you you uh I've been a dues-paying active member of political party for several decades. Okay. And I've worked hard to establish a political party and its apparatus where I live. Now, you come along and you say, you, you want to choose the candidates of our political party. And I, I go- No, 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 I, no, I, that, that's not true. Wait a minute, I, I don't want to choose your candidate. Who don't you people are unqualified to vote like Timmy, just vote all over the place. And you want them to choose Mark candidates? I and yet this is going to result in better government. All you Indies show up and you're going to start telling us how to run our political party. No, we, we don't want to tell you how to run your political party. I mean, hell, some we, we should tell you how to run your party. Why should you why should you be running yourself? We pay you. I, I mean, I mean, you, how, 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 how is it that the taxpayers, how is it that, how is it that the taxpayers fund the Democrat and Republican parties and both of those parties are not accountable to the American people that pay them? How does that work? What do you mean they're not accountable? Sure they are. On election day. But you, you want to have- You can choose your candidates. We just party. get to choose who goes well, to office or not. That's all I'm saying. We're not telling you who to put on the ballot. We're just telling you that you guys should not have a stronghold over who gets on the ballot and over who gets elected. Why? I'm because saying. There's no way in the world party. a grassroots candidate or a third party candidate can, you know, get, can get on the ballot. You guys have rigged the rules in your favor against the American people. Not you guys, but the parties. You rigged the rules. Why is it that here in Illinois, an independent candidate or a third party candidate has to get nearly three times as many signatures to be on the ballot than a, a, a candidate that belongs to one of the two major parties? Why is that? I'll tell you why, because we put together a political party and what were you doing when we did that? Where I'm were not you? used to putting together a political party. I don't want to- Where were you? Busy? Huh? Are you busy doing something else or what? Am I busy? I don't have the funds and resources to put together a political party, man. I'm just trying to make the system better for everybody. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people in this country can agree that they're not getting what they want or what they think they should be getting no matter who's in office. It don't matter. You're going to have Trump, Obama. It, it don't matter. You, you ain't, you, you, it's, it's not, government's not working for the majority of people. And we can and say, okay, union, maybe that's because people don't have agency. Union, the only people who vote in union election are union members. A union election? <laughs> the only people who vote in union election are union members. We're not talking about the union. 
We talking about the United States of America. Voting. But that's a pro but you know what who but who contributes to the union? Who pays for the for the union? The union, the members, right? The members. Okay, let's move and on. The, and the union right. is only looking out for the All right, members. Charlie, we're gonna have to move on. Look out for the members. I'm, I got one more point and I'll be done. All right, the, no the, problem. The, the Congress should be looking out for all Americans, not just the members of the party. Yeah. For the people, by the people. Which people? The people right. that's a part of a party? Okay. Um, yeah, look out for people who didn't vote for you. All right, Ernie, you're next. That's crazy. Yeah, uh, let me make sure. Okay, I'm unmuted. Actually, I put a couple questions in the... Uh, 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 in the chat, and and I know that you're busy talking, Jarrell, so you probably didn't see them there, but I want to know uh, a, uh, a few things. Uh, money in politics, how, how do you feel about that? Term limits is another thing which is a hot issue a lot of people think would help. I'd like to hear your opinion on that. And my third question is, uh, are you willing, I, I thought your PowerPoint was very good, are you willing to send that out to people? Uh, I, I can send the PowerPoint out. I don't have an issue with that. Uh, it, mind you, I, I need to figure out whether or not I can convert it to PowerPoint because I'm working off a oh. Mac and it's currently Keynote. Oh, but well, I don't know if that, so yeah. I'll, I'll get you the information regardless. If you okay. send me your email or reach out to me on my social media, I'll get you the information you want. All right. Uh, One way or another, we'll do that. I can put my email into the chat if you want to. All right, sounds good. Put that in the chat now, and I'll write it down. All right, good. And uh, Look, about money uh, term, term limits. Term limits. Yeah. I think I think term limits are good because you know it will. I mean, you could argue it's it's good or bad. I think right now people want term limits because they feel like career politicians are just milking the system and not really giving anything in return. Yeah. You know, I think I think that if you're if you're satisfied with your representative and if he's coming through. Why limit his terms? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just elect another person is what I feel. And I think the current system prevents you from electing a new person just because of the way it's set up by default. Uh, because, you know, going to Congress and getting things done is no easy task. Yeah, something it's like all a bureaucracy. It's all a power struggle. So you really have to understand how to maneuver through this bureaucratic mess. Yeah. And... They've they've shown you know how long these term limits are. You might render the new. You might make it more ineffective because people have to keep coming in, learning this, going up against the learning curve. Yeah. So um, unless there's some sort of congruency where like previous members are consulting and helping work through this process, but but yeah. So I I, I think ultimately uh, electoral reform is where it's at. You said money and politics. <laughs> I think that we need to make it fairer to have little money get involved in politics. There's no reason why elections and campaigns should cost as much as they cost. Yeah. Millions of dollars and you're getting on air, you're getting on national TV and they're talking about they're talking about this manufacturing consent, you know, mainstream media is nothing but propaganda. So like they always had these quote unquote experts. What experts? These experts are funded by someone that wants them to propagate one point or the other. So they're not really trusted. So I, I think that we need to make a mechanism to make this, to, to open it up to where it's easier or accessible for less well-known candidates to run. I think that was actually one of the provisions of H HR one, that was that uh, that legislative that uh, you, are you you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there was a bill they were trying to I pass. Refresh me, refresh us on that. There was a bill they were trying to pass. I think it was HR one. Uh, they didn't. I think it was a Fair Voters Representation Act, something like that. That was one of the provisions around around money and politics. They were trying to utilize. I think like funds from like uh, the penalties paid by corporations for breaking laws to help fund elections or something along those lines. They were trying to make it fair for like lesser known candidates. They were trying to balance it out. But yes, I think money in politics is definitely an issue because 
it's almost like you have to pay for representation. You have to pay. And that's pay. that sounds like pay to play to me. Okay. All right. All like, right. I think it's wrong. Okay, Jake, you got the let you got one more question, and if anybody else doesn't yeah, okay. have okay. Uh, first, first of all, in response to Ernie, um, I'm 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 ad, I'm adamantly I'm adamantly opposed to term limits. Um, but but the only thing worse than a professional politician is an unprofessional politician. Uh, uh, my question is, you got uh, rank fi rank choice voting. How would that work? Okay, so are, are you a are you an NCAA fan? Do you watch college basketball? No. All right, I, I don't either, so I, I, I can't use that analogy. Um, so basically, ranked choice voting it, it works similar to those brackets. So ranked choice voting, you would all the candidates would be on one ballot, and you would rank your top five candidates. You know, one, two, three, four, five, and in the primary election, in the first election. If not one candidate gained 50% or more of the vote, they would have an instant runoff. And the candidate with the least amount of votes would get knocked out of the race. And they okay. would continue that process of an instant runoff until one candidate received 50% or more of the vote. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, what's the difference between that and the system of proportional representation? I have I'm not familiar with that term proportional representation. Well, I think, it, I think it might be similar. Proportional there, there are different types of proportional representation, but for okay. example, for example, in in Weimar Germany, they had a system of proportional representation. That's how Adolf Hitler got in, or his party. His party, yeah, there, there's a multi-party system. His party only, in 1933, his party received uh, only 28% of the vote, but it was the largest pl pl plurality, so he won the vote. He won the election. Or his party won the election, and he, his, the Nazi party then appointed him. So, 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 so the Nazi party won 28% of the vote? 28% of the vote in 1933, but it was the largest pl plurality, so they won the election. Right, so how could that be possible if you have to get 50% or more of the vote? Well, I'm saying because of the multi-party system. It's proportional representation. So he got, his party got the largest proportion. So no, that, that's, the that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about that. Yeah. You know, what? trust me, as a matter of fact, you know, that was actually something during the 2020 election. You know, I, I have mixed reviews on Trump. Okay, I have mixed reviews. I'm not all the way for him. I'm not all the way against him. You know, but that was one of the things that I was actually worried about when I was right. advocating for this. I was like, oh, my gosh, is, it, is, it, is, this, a, is this like another Hitler going on? Because that's what the mainstream media was pushing. That's how they were pushing. And so I was I was definitely worried about that. But uh, uh, do I don't remember, do you, I'm yeah, sorry. But I don't think that would have. But, but we saw that wasn't the case. OK, that was that, that that didn't happen. You know, but I don't think that this form of. um. Elections would allow that because it's not, it's not, there you go. You just explained the difference right there. What you're saying, the, the, the form, the, the, whatever proportional representation, what you're talking about is right. whatever party gets the majority of the vote. Okay. Right. We're talking about a candidate getting 50% or more of the vote. So right. it's not, okay, well, you have three parties, the Dems got 20%. The Republicans got 40%, and then the independents got 10%, and then the rest was like scattered between the rest. So since the Republicans got 40, they win. No, that's not what we're talking about. Like, one, the candidate has to get the majority of the people to win. And I think this uh, also comes up to a, uh, a great point that a few of the other people uh, brought up earlier when they were talking about um, the rural areas, you know, I, 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 I can agree with that because I don't know, I haven't looked at the numbers, but I don't know if collectively, are there more people in cities, let's just say all the cities combined versus all the rural people combined? You know, I, oh, yeah. I don't know, yeah, but yeah. I guess common, the yeah. common sense answer probably would say yes. I'm not entirely yeah, sure is, though. 
cities but, have larger cities have sorry? larger population. The cities okay, have larger but, populations than rural areas. Okay, but you said there's a larger or smaller? No, a larger. Right, of course, the larger. So it's probably like it's 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 more smaller areas combined than you get what I'm trying to say. Right. I mean, it's hell, the, the rural population are like the Trump. So I I don't know how that really would be like too much of a an issue, I think. But um but did, did that answer your question? Well, sort of. I just so so rank rank choice voting would mean I got you. So auto, automatically, so automatically, you 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 rank rank the you rank the candidates in in terms of how your your first first second third fourth and fifth choices, and then the the top two vote getters would would be faced in a runoff. Is that right? Well, only only if it came to that. So let's just say before the general, if one person got fifty percent or more, they would just win. Oh, okay. No- Okay. But like, let's All just right. say you voted. So, so, so let's just say your top choice didn't didn't win, right? right. Like, let's let's just say your let's just say in the first the first election, right? Your for right. your first choice, your personal first choice, did not right. get fifty percent of the votes. Right. In the runoff, if your for, first choice received the least amount of votes, he would be yeah. knocked out the race. So your vote okay. will go to your second choice. Okay. Automatically, totally your vote will go to your second choice. There wouldn't be yeah. another okay. election where you go cast a new ballot. They would okay. just I take your, you. you get what I'm saying? Your first, If your first choice I got you. knocked out the first round, I your second I choice you. would get your vote. And that would happen for everyone I until I one of those I candidates you. got the most votes. Yeah, there been any? Have there any been any places where they have there been? Okay, there been, okay, been, been, been Just one more question: Have there been any places where that's been tried successfully? I think Alaska just passed it, but off the top of my head, I don't know because ranked really choice voting Australia. is something I was just introduced to about like two months ago, honestly. Okay. Right. Yeah, Ireland's been just using it for years. And picking their mayor just within the last several months. Wow. The deposit really? was, was giving a little lesson using piece pizza toppings as to how you how it works. <laughs> Nobody pizza remembers. That. So who so who won the election in in, 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 in Ireland in the, this mayor's election? Does it matter? Okay. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's move on now to rebuttals. Uh, I'd like to say, Gerald, you really handled yourself uh, well against all the, uh, how shall we say, assaults. Yeah, I'm sweating over here. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to ch- get a chance to relax. And all let right. These, let these clowns go. So, Margaret, you're first. Who okay. else has got rebuttals? Raj. Raj does. All right, Ernie does. And we always know Charlie does. Okay, so I have Margaret, Rod, Ernie, and Charlie. Who else? Bob Matt, are you going to get involved with this too? Yeah, I'll, I'll do one. All right, Bob. I'm not going to do one tonight, but we have Margaret and we have Charlie. Raj, okay, so I have Margaret, Raj, Ernie, Bob, and Charlie. Anybody else? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on Jarrell's side. So. Well, you want to say anything now? Be the time. Nancy, you want to do anything? Mr. Matz, how about you? You always got a good rebuttal going. Okay, seeing as how it's 7.53, I'm going to give you guys about five minutes each. I'll run a run a clock. So, uh, you know, maybe I, and then, then we can also go to six. Now, Gerald, you'll get the last word. If anybody else gets up, you'll have a chance to go. So, uh, all right, the speaking order, I'm going to lower hands. It's going to be Margaret, Raj, Ernie, Bob, and Charlie. Is that all acceptable to everybody? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, and then I think I'm going to go six minutes because we got a little bit more time involved. Um, just bear with me while I get a clock going. Um, I'll do it on my other computer here, so it won't take me but a minute or two. So, uh, um. All right, Margaret, go ahead. You got the uh, floor, and you can go ahead and start rebutting. 
Okay. Um, Six I... minutes. <laughs> Won't need that much. Well, Thank you right. very much for your presentation. You were you were well prepared to explain it, and when you didn't know, you said you didn't know, which is not what people do, including <laughs> me sometimes. So I really appreciate that. Um, if you look at human history, we've always been rural because we've been hunter-gatherer societies. And when we went into agriculture, then we got into small groups, but in general, smaller groups. With industrialization, we went from the rural to urban population shifts where 80% uh, of the people lived in the rural areas in the, in the 19th century and, and now 95% of the people live in urban areas. So the actual numbers in 2020, there were 57.47 million people in rural areas total and in urban areas, 274 million people. So that's that. Um, I think in terms of uh, your ideas, I think are good in terms of uh, um, making voting perhaps a little fairer and, um, and, and moving along electoral things. And, um, but I think that there's some really profound reforms that have to go in in campaign financing where you don't have huge um, groups giving lots of money that nobody knows where it comes from to candidates that uh, maybe public, actually public financing of, uh, uh, of campaigns. And when, uh, in the Thursday one, there's a guy from England and he said, you know, in England, the campaign is five weeks long. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> ah! <laughs> and it does, so it doesn't cost the money. And, um, and you know, people, you, you, you go out and you campaign very intensively for five weeks, and then that's it. Done. So um, started and done, which we really do not have here. I mean, Trump was campaigning for re-election right after he was elected. So um, as, as what were many other candidates, I have to say, uh, maybe not so much intensively Obama, but certainly Trump and certainly some other people. Anyway, doesn't matter. That's kind of, I think that those kinds of cam campaign finance reforms have to happen and campaign reform has to happen before we really have fair campaigns. And that includes the people with the gerrymandering having the, the dominant political party be in charge of redistricting needs to change too. We, we, there's computer programs that can do redistricting much more fairly and, um, than um, backs, back rooms that are filled with smoke and people getting emphysema. Anyway, so that's it. Okay, um, Raj, you're next yes. on the rebuttals. Jarel, so I gave you a hard time and uh, get ready to get more hard time because uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty focused on, uh, on a dynamics and success. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a nice guy in a sense there be, you know, be, be nice and be say, you know, say good thing because uh, I'm in business. The, 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 when I decided to come here this morning, the first thing I put down a, a single word, knowledge. What kind of knowledge my man has of process, practice, and what is happening in the world? Okay, so so that that, that was the main thing because a person who, who is spokesman for the company, he should have a, those answers. Okay, otherwise, what it, it's just like a in a White House uh, report that guy lady. What do you call it? Uh, he see, he takes for the answer. I, I know what you're talking about the, new, the 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 press the press uh the, right, the right, press right. representative something right. like so that. So she had she, she had to know it. Otherwise, reporters miss reports and do all those things. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing. Sec, second second thing is that the the 
that there is a misapprehension uh, that the world is that simple. It's not that simple. It's very, very complicated. We have a three million, 300 plus million people and we have $25 billion GDP. And so it, it, it is a so complex that average person goes, average person living in Chicago, okay, he doing his business and, and he, has, he has a relations with the bank and everything, he's doing nice thing. But, and he, he watches politics, but he may not have a knowledge on issue. And if you do not have a knowledge, you are nobody in Congress. Most mm -hmm. of the congressmen cannot participate for simple reason. Then only, only the committee chairman and, and, and that other, other party person at top level, they have all the information. And they have a lots of, lots of people who help him. They, 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 they have several. And besides the Congress has a whole, whole bunch of people who works on issues. It's very, very complicated. I, I had a friend of mine for two years. He went from the University of Utah and he was an assistant dean of students. He, he went to, he got elected to Utah Senate and he worked two terms. After that, he wrote me a letter and he said, Raj, you know, what looks simple, that will make a difference there. I could not because systems, and knowledge required and time required is so complex that you got to have a lots of other people helping you to play these issues. And, mm -hmm. and so, so what you are saying is that I do not, I do, I do not think that what you, are, what you are want to make a difference by, by how you elect leaders. Problem we have is that we do not, do not have qualified leaders. Leaders do not, congressmen and senators do not come with the knowledge required to be there. Okay, and look, our, our governor, our mayor, mayor was expert on a policy reform. And she ran on that. Okay, and, and she, she is elected and we have biggest problem in a police crime. In a crime. And after a couple of, couple of police chief, and we are not doing good. So, so it's not that, even if you know, it's not simple. The New York, New York governor was a very nice guy. He got elected, he had a very good thing. Everything was the right, okay? Nobody said he was a bad guy. He was a right guy, he was a qualified guy. He had knowledge, he had work, work in a system, okay? But he come and he, and he had so much problem. Everything is failing. Crime is bad, okay? See issues he are not able to handle. People is not able to get a point, okay? And all this, all this thing happened. I need, a, I need a qualified person who knows system, who knows people, and who knows the process. And if you don't have that, if you do not elect that qualified man, at least, and that qualified man you cannot get in your system for your suggestion. See, so you have to understand that, that we are trying to do something that is good for the country and look, Everybody, there are 325 million people, and those 100 people representing or 500 people representing them, nobody's going. I mean, there is no way anybody, the how good intention, can can help these people satisfy what they think is right. Jesus cannot go to people, and Jesus can get two or three people from a death to life, but still whole, whole bunch of people were dying. He couldn't do anything. And, and that is the reality. I thank you for coming here. Thank you for knowledge. Thank you for the enthusiasm. And, and uh, but, but I tell you, there's a lot more to that. And, and if you want to be somebody in a politics, then it's a hard, and you got to work lots of hard. You got to know lots of knowledge. You got to talk to lots of people about advice rather than telling them, and I wish you luck. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you Rob. Thanks a lot. Um, Ernie, I guess you're next. Yeah, okay. Well, again, uh, Gerald, thank you for a good presentation. Uh, enjoyed it very much, and I have been looking forward to this because I'm very much uh, 
thinking along the lines you are thinking that our two party system is just not serving us as, as well as it should and we need to change it. I think you have brought up, I think open primaries would help. A right uh, of ranked choice voting would help. I think we need to get money out of politics as much as possible. Uh, otherwise, regardless of how you do it, you'll have people uh, feeling influenced by candidates and or candidates will be influenced by groups, whether they be private businesses or or other other groups uh, to a to a degree that they shouldn't be. Uh, so that's all very important. More information. There are groups out there that provide extensive information on candidates uh, that you know you can just look them up. I've forgotten the name of the groups, but you, they 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 support almost every ballot in the country, and you can look up the candidate. And they they don't uh, write or state opinions, but they. Uh, uh, forward you to articles about these people. So that's information. That's very important uh, as well. So all of these things, and I like the idea of term limits. I, I see that they have, uh, you know, there are, there are ups and downs, but goods and bads in term limits. But I think that uh, uh, some version of term limits uh, would be good. And the only place we really have it in this country is for president. And uh, so, so I agree with an awful lot of what you're saying. I think it's, it's very good. I hope it comes to be. Uh, I don't have anything against parties. In, in most countries in Europe, they have multiple parties. And I think that has the same effect, uh, you know, because there are more uh, parties that actually have a chance that actually get candidates elected uh, to office and have at least some influence or potential influence. So, so multiple parties are good. I don't have anything against party, but also individuals who want to have nothing to do with any particular party uh, should be able to uh, run a decent campaign as well. And I, I don't know how long it's going to take to get something like this. It's going to be hard because, of course, the people who make the changes and who make the difference are incumbents. And so they will continue to want to, uh, to be incumbents and and I know that I've I've talked to various candidates who were in favor of term limits before they were elected but then once they were elected they changed their mind they said no term limits are not a good idea <laughs> and and they also uh, don't want to restrict money in politics as much because once you're in you have first of all you have the advantage of name recognition you don't need as much money but you can also get more money so I think you're on the right track. I hope that you will continue working on this. I put my email into the chat. I hope you'll look at it and send me some information on yourself and on uh, uh, on all of these groups if possible, or put me on the list for all of these groups because I'm interested in pursuing this. And I think we should have you or somebody from your group or somebody like you back on a regular basis. So Again, thank you. Uh, uh, E has an echo, Norman with two R's at gsb.uchicago.edu. You got it. That's it. It should right. get to me. Sounds good. All right. Uh, Bob, you're next. Go ahead, Bob. Unmute, Bob. You got uh, it. Okay. Hey, uh, all right. Thanks, uh, uh, Jarrell, for your uh, presentation tonight. Um, Gosh, years ago, like, uh, I don't know, maybe 20, 20 years ago or 22 years ago, I read Ralph Nader's book called Crashing the Party. And uh, I highly recommend that book, by the way. And uh, in that, you know, he documents, you know, all the trouble there is with the party system and, and, and ballot access, you know, trying to get on ballots and, you know, all the signatures and all that other stuff. And then, the, of course, the uh, the two major parties are the ones that run the, the presidential debates and they, you know, they don't want to let anybody else in except, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans and all that. So, uh, so I, I have some uh, empathy there for, for what you're trying to do uh, to get people on the ballot. Um, even though it, it, the way America right now is so uh, divided, you know, in the, in the left and right, I don't know if, you know, libertarians or greens or 
independence or anybody else would really do any better than they have in the past with, with limited access to you know, the times they have gotten out of ballot. Uh, because it's kind of really, really important now that uh, uh, like this big battle going on between left and right, this is essentially the battle between, you know, individualism and collectivism and, uh, and the Democrats are the, you know, the American Marxist collectives and they are, uh, you know, uh, essentially a, a theocracy without, a, you know, with a secular religion and, uh, and with all the dogmatism of the, uh, you know, with all the transgender and identity politics and gay rights and all that stuff uh, that they're trying to shove down our throats and uh, groom children for and all that. Um, so I think it's I think it's important to those of us that are constitutional conservatives, uh, traditional people that believe in traditional family values and patriotism and things like that, I think it's very important for us to remove these American Marxists from control of all of our institutions and look at the mess our country's in now that, you know, Biden's got it in after just, you know, this short period of time. Uh, so that's quite important. <laughs> it has to be done. Damn it. Um, now, I don't know if some, uh, you know, possibly some real, uh, yeah, you know, uh, some some third party candidate maybe with that's really uh, got some uh, uh, charisma or something might be able to to do it. But uh, you know, right now I I, I don't think so. Uh, last I heard, it looks like Joe Biden's going to be out in 2024. There's a dump Joe movement inside the Democratic Party, and uh, I don't know who they're going to run in 2024. But uh, it's, it's it'll be not going to be Joe Biden. <laughs> they're they're going to they're going to get him get rid of him right after the twenty two elections, uh, is what I understand. Now the money in politics that's another thing. Uh, I did a presentation some years ago, uh, I did, about money in politics, and uh, I did some research, and you know it turns out that uh, like for senat senatorial and congressional campaigns, you know there's a th certain threshold, a certain number of dollars. That, can't remember what it was. It wasn't really a whole bunch, really. There's like a, kind of a minimum you need to get, you know, an office and a staff and some radio ads and some banners and things like that. Uh, and then, but above and beyond that amount, uh, it, it's a diminishing return. So each additional dollar you get gives you fewer and fewer votes. So I'm, I'm sort of not really that concerned about the unlimited money. Now, for instance, look at this, this race shaping up for uh, Illinois governor between Darren Bailey and uh, J.B. Pritzker. Uh, now Pritzker's got like, he's already sunk about 90 million in his campaign or something. And he's got unlimited funding for more. And poor Darren Bailey's got like, he had one billionaire investor that gave him like $10 million. And that's basically all he's got. And now he's got to go up against money bags Pritzker here. However, Look at the look at the uh, uh, you know, the, the baggage that Pritzker has to carry into this election now. You know, six dollar a gallon gas, uh, no 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 baby formula. Uh, you know, cars cost you know thirty forty percent more than they used to. Uh, we're going to have brownouts probably. We're going to have food shortages. Uh, all this stuff happening. That could that's not going to bode well for Pritzker in the fall, even with even with all his dough. Uh, you know that's that's going to hurt. Now you know he's probably going to lose some. Uh, you know, I mean Darren will probably lose some women votes because of the abortion thing, but uh, maybe maybe when maybe that'll settle down by then, and people will will, uh, will realize that hey, you know that Roe v. Wade did not make abortion illegal we're just they're just throwing it to the states where it should have been anyway and so by the way speaking of roe v wade we should congratulate uh, the supreme court for finally doing that turning that back over to the states where it should should have always been and uh, number two we should th also thank the supreme court for uh the uh uh striking down new york's unconstitutional law against uh uh 
carrying a, a weapon, uh, making it, you know, making you have to uh, go through a couple of different tests uh, to uh, carry a weapon to prove that you need one. Uh, when all you really need to do is prove that you are a, uh, a law abiding citizen. And okay. I guess, am I out of time? Yeah, you've been, you've been, you've been, you went oh. six and a half minutes. But, uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. That's and all right. That's, I should go a little longer. All right, Charlie, you're next. Hey, my friend. Charlie, you're next. Unmute, Charlie. Uh, Six minutes. You went to sleep. Well, I'm I'm going to start stockpiling food, according to Bob. We all better get to the grocery tomorrow. Anyhow, thank you, uh, sir, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Very detailed, well prepared, and for your efforts. Uh, to bring about change in the election process. I'll be eclectic as usual. I'll cover uh, four specific areas. Number one, you seem to make some case that the government of the United States was ineffective and the legislative things that, oh, well, obvious for Congress and, and any session of Congress, you say you seem to think that no one introduces legislation at any given time, there's 2,000 to 2,500 active laws in progress. Matter of fact, for one issue, you probably have multiple solutions which are seeking passage. <clears throat> so, and the federal workforce, as far as I know, representing them has not gone away anywhere and they're functioning smooth. I mean, there was some difficulty during the Trump administration, uh, although it's functioning quite well and the, the nation seems to be on course. We do have some issues outstanding, but they're not insurmountable. Uh, anyhow, I, I'm not aware that anytime I lobby, I go see them, Congressman, and I either vote for legislation that's been introduced or recommend legislation. And that's been the case. And, very often it has the chief fruition of passage of legislation, which I advocated. And they will take up your, your uh, cause if they are on the committee so forth. And you present a sufficient arguments as the need for change in that regard. So I don't know what you're talking about in that regard. And the next thing there, you seem to have some issue with organization. which I don't know how in this day and age you can preclude people from organizing, given social media and the means at the disposal, organization of a political nature is easier than it's ever been in the history of this nation. To preclude it from happening, um, I think is the is not gonna take place. You may try to, now you may not like the rules in place. Well, I don't know if that's, that's you, you don't like the rules. That, that's for some reason. Now, what the reason I'm getting into this here, a few years ago, the number of the environmentalists wanted to put together a Green Party and run a candidate for president. In order to do so, we had established a political party, not only in the state of Illinois, but in all the 50 states. And guess what? We did it. And we ran a candidate and we did not do bad. I think we got about 15 to 20 percent of the vote. Now, I don't know of any barriers that have been posed or impediments from any group that would like to do so today. So go do it like we did. Did it take some effort? Yes. Uh, have we been totally successful? That's not anything to blame on the system. It's our own fault for not putting together viable campaigns uh, in that regard. Uh, regarding term limits, it is totally un ridiculous to s throw somebody out of a position for years of credible service. And termination has to be for just cause, not just because they've been in a job for a certain period of time that you're disqualified from doing it in the future. That's the very individuals you want and need. And there's no guarantee whatsoever, this is what amazes me about, that if you have term limits, that the new candidate, the new person taking office 
is going to be more qualified than the one you're getting rid of. If you cannot guarantee that, then why do it? It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to discard someone who's experienced and qualified, capable and performing well, and replace them with someone who's absolutely incompetent. I feel no argument. It wouldn't make it in any union contract. It's called years of credible service, it's called seniority. Um, yeah, let's see here. Yeah, you guys want to change the rules here. Well, you know, work within the party system. They will welcome you if you chair to participate. Now, the last thing is I got to talk about independent voters. And I know Jackie Shallot was starting something years ago and not in New York to organize independent voters. But now that I think about it, I got to wonder what kind of voters these are. And you mentioned a case where people who voted for Bernie and then voted for Trump. Well, what kind of voters are they? I, I've got to wonder. I, that makes, that, that is some strangest. You know what that is? That's an indication of someone who's unqualified to vote. Now, at no time in the history of this nation has the distinction been clearer between the two major political parties. You have the Democrats and Republicans. Now, why somebody is not on either side when the difference is greater than it's ever been is means only one thing, that they have no knowledge, working knowledge whatsoever of the issues. There's no explanation other than that, that someone isn't on one side or the other. You've got to be kidding me. When there's a clear disparity in choice greater than it's ever been. And you're saying, well, I can't decide or I haven't decided. I, 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 I'm sorry, do you have any explanation how you could remain neutral. <laughs> and I mean, we, you mentioned several issues tonight, right. guns and abortion, ah, da, 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 da. and to say, well, I don't have any views whatsoever on any of these. I've got to wonder, and you want these people voting in right. for our candidates. Charlie, you're, well, at, uh, you're at seven minutes and 30 seconds. All right, I'll let you go. All, all, right, right, all, right, you got, all right, Charlie, we're going to have to uh, cut off your rebuttal now because I think John... I said I'm done. Okay. It's his so. group. We can't cut him off. It's his group. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, sometimes I wonder if he should be term limited or time limited. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. The guy right. who supports Pence, can you believe it? Tim... Sends out emails that he likes pens. I do. Okay. And he wants the vote. I'm sorry, Charlie. Tell and me never... why you like pens. Charlie, we're not going to go down this rabbit hole now. <laughs> John Eldon, are you ready to? Uh... In the right mind. Yeah. I, I like cats. So, all right, John, we're going to give you, uh, since you've come in at the last minute, We'll give you six minutes, so go ahead and... Okay, uh, I don't even need... I'm rebutting right. Charlie. All right. Uh, I am ahead. a centrist. Right. I'm a lifelong independent. The problem is I agree with the Democrats on some things. I agree with the Republicans on others. And many times I find both parties too polarized. The truth is rarely found in the extremes. I look for compromise, which is the dirty word to the two parties, but it's the only way we move ahead. I look for consensus where possible, compromise where not. And that's why I'm an independent. That's why I'm a lifelong swing voter, moderate. And I, I lean somewhat conservative on fiscal issues, uh, somewhat liberal on environmental. I'm pro-business, I'm pro-capitalism. Uh, and, and I'm also anti-theocracy. So, you know, independent, if I lean anywhere, it's probably libertarian. And then neither major party is going to speak for that. So that's where I am. So I'm not ignorant. I'm not a flip-flop. Uh, I'm not unqualified to vote. I reject everything Charlie said about that, about 
mischaracterizing and not understanding what an independent voter is. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna take a couple minutes myself. Um, the one thing that always uh, comes in, at, John, I agree with you a lot because I too am somewhat of a centrist. I'm for what works. But normally what happens when politicians come into power, they succumb to something like this, temptation. And that means, uh, you know, all it takes to keep my cat quiet is this little packet of temptations here, otherwise known as a pocket bribe which I've been doing most of the night. Um, but you know, the thing is once you can run a good political campaign, you can run a good, uh, get elected to office. But once you get into office and you start getting into Washington, there is a clear path that a lot of senators and congressmen get tempted with power. They get a lot of lobbyists and a lot of money coming in and they start getting courted by special interests and, you know, that's the one thing that, uh, you know, one of our founding fathers said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I don't know how in the hell we can get rid of that out of politics, but I would think that, you know, an election is what the one thing that does hold people accountable, whether we have it. And political parties are on some sense too, also uh, a good thing, but, you know, Sometimes having a slew of them may not be the worst thing, but it can also be a bad thing, like what's been happening in Israel. They've had five elections in two years with their, and they've had a, a continual shuffle of their leadership over time. Or even Great Britain, even though the British House of Commons is a rather entertaining uh, program, if you ever watched it on C-SPAN, um, you'll find, though, that politics can get rather divisive over there, too, and you have to get a coalition going. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to do this, but Gerald, you do give some good points about your uh, independent voting and everything else. I wish sometimes that centrists would be in a little bit more power. Anyway, enough said. Anybody else wanting to rebut real quick? Otherwise, I'm going to open it up for Gerald to do closing remarks and do whatever he wants to say and take the time you need, Gerald, to rebut or how you want to handle it. All right, first, I'd like to make a comment regarding uh, Roger's statements. I, I do agree with Raj and his point about, you know, the salesman being the face of the company and him needing to, you know, have the knowledge. So I, I will be the first to admit that there are, I do have some gaps in knowledge that I do need to improve upon. Uh, I was skeptical to do this, but I went on ahead and did it anyway. Because that's the only way you learn is by making mistakes. So I will definitely work on improving my gap in knowledge. So thanks for that constructive criticism. Also, he made a comment about it being very complicated and I agree with him in that instance. I do agree that um, a lot of the issues in uh, people's lives now are partially part of the government's fault, but they're also partially part of an individual's fault for their own personal decisions that they make. I think that all parties and when I say all parties, I mean government and individual people could be making better decisions to make this country better for everyone. Uh, in regards to Charlie's notion of what an independent voter is, you know, without any disrespect, I feel as if you might be one of the people that are far left. You might be in an idea, uh, in, 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 like very heavily in, in, entrenched in your ideologies. And whether you think you're right or wrong because you're on the left, doesn't matter. It's, in my personal opinion, it's, I still think it's bad. Um, and it's almost calling the kettle black, call it the, the kettle calling the stove black, if that makes any sense. Uh, I, 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 I agree with, who was this? What John was saying about, I think right now the system basically is built upon the notion that we have to pit one another against each other. And that's what's going on right now. I hear the clear distinction of left and right. I get that. But most of these issues that they're talking about, they're just out there to, you know, manufacture this app, like he said, you know, to pit us against one another. And the majority of people, when you're walking down the street, they're, they're not really worried about these issues. One way or another, you're going to get done what you need to get done. And I just feel like, we need to get out of this system of pitting each other against one another because everything is just to the extreme. Everything is to the extreme. And it's not fair that when you 
are promoting the extreme of one end of the other, you're missing out on so much that's in the middle that's not even getting talked about. And ultimately, you're not even addressing the majority of the other issues. So I think independent voters are tired of the BS. You know, I, I'm in the military, you know, and even when I'm walking outside, I mean, you don't, it doesn't look the way it does outside, the way it's being portrayed on the media. It doesn't look that way. <laughs> we, we have our issues, but I think individual people are willing to set aside their differences to come together to work to work to accomplish something and that, that and that's ultimately i wish that that would be more in the news but it's not because it doesn't sell so the drama is what sells and uh that's why it's the way it is unfortunately uh there were a couple of other points charlie made that i wanted to rebut on by <laughs> i forgot i didn't take good enough notes but there was a point that he did make that I agreed with. I forget which one it was. I hate that because I really want to give him kudos on something other than the fact that, you know, I, I appreciate his efforts in hosting such an, uh, an organization. I like the way the manner in which you do it. Uh, I particularly like your, uh, liked your uh, introductory comment about the, about the fools. I thought that was funny. I really enjoyed that. And just, um, Thank you for all your work and thank you for putting this together and thank you for having me on. You know, I, I look forward to, uh, you know, I, I think I'll come back and, you know, just be a participant and just watch some of the other presentations you have. And I do look forward to, you know, uh, also um, speaking with you in the future as well. So, and thank you everybody for attending and thanks for all your comments. Hey, um, right. Margaret, I know you had raised your hand, but we're going to conclude the presentation okay, first. And then we'll we'll get back into our general discussion afterwards. So, Gerald, if you want to stick around for the uh, after party, I'm going to formally close out our presentation. So, good night, everyone.